Thank you, everybody. Glad to have you here. Really excited about this. I'll have some more upcoming programs at the end of my talk as well, just so you kind of you kind of see what's coming up. I am going to give you a little advance notice for next month. I am not going to do a weekly program next month. But before before everybody rejoices too loudly about me not doing this. We will have a weekly program. We've been looking at how we transition from this weekly program that I'm doing going forward. The response has been fantastic and not just from people who are local and can come by regularly, but from longtime supporters who've moved a little farther away from new supporters from, you know, across the country, all over the place. And so we really, really want to be able to continue this interaction. It's just, I can't do it weekly anymore. We didn't think this was going to be a full year of it anyway. So be on the lookout for that. It'll be myself for, for some of them. It'll be other staff members and it'll be some different things. Get, get a chance to see more of the, the gardens itself live. So, so just be on the lookout for that. Should be very, very exciting. A lot of fun. I think everybody will love it. And of course, we'll still always be here to, to chat with everybody and join everybody. And I will do this at least once a week because I am really enjoying it. Okay, we're going to jump right in. This week, we're going to talk about winter bark. It's something I love. It's something that, I, you know, when I, when I used to work in retail long, long ago, I used to try and convince people to buy plants because of the bark. And I found that that can be a hard sell for a lot of people. You know, they want flowers, they want bright foliage, but the bark is there year round. And so I think it's really exciting. And I love walking around this time of year and looking at the bark. And I'm going to be talking about a lot of plants with really unusual or exceptional bark, but really just the textures you see walking around outside, you know, down your street, through the woods, something if you pay attention this time of year, it really can be quite striking to see the winter bark on a lot of plants. So jump in with one of the more recent in the last 10 years or so, Japanese maples. One of the real popular Japanese maples for decades and decades has been Sangu Kaku, the coral bark maple. This one Acer palmatum bihu has gold to orange stems during the winter. During the rest of the year, it's very similar to typical green leaf Japanese maple, except for these stems. Its newest growth is the brightest orange, and then it becomes gold. And you can see the gold last quite a bit, quite a few years back. Ultimately, when these get large, you start to lose a lot of that gold color on the oldest branches. It's just the newest growth. Some people cut them back to keep them going. I'll, I'll show an example of a couple examples of that with some different plants. But I found it to be a really easy maple. It grows better for me than most of the coral bark maples do with the red bark. I always love this because the first time my daughter saw it, she was quite young. She was visiting a nursery with me. I was picking up some plants for the arboretum and she saw this plant and fell in love with it. And she was not, she still isn't a plant person really, but she loved it. And she was maybe six or eight years old and she called it the cheese maple because she said it looked like cheese. I have no idea where kids get these things, but she still calls it the cheese maple and she's in her twenties now. So always has kind of a good memory for me. So I grow it, but what I do is at my home, I will often cut the branches back very, very hard and let it re-sprout. So I get a lot of this new growth and it also keeps it kind of smaller in size, but it doesn't make quite as elegant of a maple shape. So I lose out on that, but I keep the bright stems. This is another plant with bright gold stems, Acer Nagundo. This is our native box elder. Eastern Nagundo winter lightning. And this has kind of stout yellow stems, real showy, and really glows in the sunset. They just get this, this real warm glow. Now, when we had planted this originally, it was, you know, I think from here up, you know, it was kind of a plant like that. And it was really beautiful and it got bigger and bigger. We, we kept it growing as a tree growing up. And it, over time, over a course of 10 or so years, the yellow got to be, so it was just at the tips as the trunk got bigger and bigger. And the trunk was probably close to 12 inches around. And it just, 
it wasn't very showy anymore. So we came in and did some chainsaw pruning and pruned it all the way back to the ground and let it re-sprout and kind of this shrubbyish plant. And the, those young stems were really vigorous, had that whole root system and they, they grew long and gold. And now it's getting to the point where we're losing those gold on those stems again. So rather than wait for it to get as huge as it did before, we're gonna come in and cut out some of these older stems, clean it up, get the shape a little bit better, but allow a lot of new growth to shoot up again. And we do this, we have a willow called flame that's got bright red winter twigs. I didn't put a picture in it, but every two, three, four years, we'll go in and cut it down to a stump. That's called coppicing, you know, where you cut down to a stump and you get a lot of small branches coming up. And that both, keeps height down. It leads to a lot of vigorous new growth. So with something with colorful stems, you get all those stems and it's a real easy way to grow the plants. The other option, we could come into this plant or to that willow and we could just take out a few branches here and there every year, every two years to keep it, always have some young stems coming up, but keep more size to it. Both methods are great. With the larger trees like the willow and this box elder, I kind of like coppicing better just because it's easy. You just whack everything at one time and let it all re-sprout. With plants like the red and gold twig dogwoods, Cornus alba and Cornus sericea, and even our native Cornus amomum, the silky dogwood, the youngest stems have that red as well. Now with these, I like to come in and, and probably, so this, I just took this this morning. This is all looks good. I wouldn't do any pruning on this this year. It's a young plant and we'll let it go. But probably next winter, you see how this is starting to get brown, the, it's starting to get that secondary bark on there. You see that and this and maybe, you know, there are a few of the older branches that are starting to get, get brown and barky. We'll go in during the winter and we'll cut those out cut it out, cut it out. That'll leave the bright red stems and it'll put out new growth in the spring that'll be really bright. The brightest color stems will be in the first year growth. And so every year after that, we'll take out just a handful of the oldest stems and that will, that will keep the plant rejuvenated and young. It'll keep it from getting too tall because the st stems won't keep growing up, but it'll also keep it really bright. Now, once it gets into summer, it doesn't really matter. It'll cover itself in the, you know, nice green leaves, has white flowers and these little clusters, tops followed by blue berries that the birds absolutely love. White berries and, and some of the red twig dogwoods, blueberries and others, depending on the species. And they, um, the birds just, just eat them up, but they don't seem to, they don't seem to spread them around much. So that, that hadn't been a problem. These are great for damp spots. If you've got kind of a wet spot in the garden, you can plant these. One is really nice, you know, especially if you give it a backdrop of evergreen plants or other things, but you can also, it's, it's really beautiful if you've got, if you can plant out a whole bunch of them together, then it's more work to go cut the older stems out. And a lot of times people stop doing that, but if you do it, you will be rewarded with a real show. And there are a whole bunch of different ones, but here you can see one that's, that's really hasn't been kept clean like that. So what I would do, so I'd look at this and say, this is pretty overgrown. I'd come in there. You can, if it's really been overgrown and you don't want to deal with it, you could come in there and just cut it all the way off, kind of like coppicing a large tree. But I would come in, I would take out all of these old woody stems, anything that's getting older than that's and bigger than, you know, maybe the size of your, your pinky or thumb and cut it all the way back to the ground, just a pair of pruners. And when it's become overgrown, it can be kind of a pain to do that. But if you do that, and then next year, take out the oldest and each year, just take out a, a, a few stems that are the oldest in there. This will be, this will show up so much brighter red. It'll really look like this again instead of uh, instead of this. Now another a native that people really know about for the bark are eastern native river birches. Uh, this is a dwarf one called Little King or Fox Valley. We've got maybe the largest Little King that I've ever seen. It's 
25 feet tall and wide, but it has the typical river birch bark that peels off in these sheets. It gets rough and then starts peeling. Really beautiful, beautiful thing. Here in the east with our heat and humidity, a lot of the really white stemmed, like the Himalayan birches, especially Jackmanii and, and those don't really perform very well. They get borers very often. They're just very, very stressed for us while the river birches do fantastic. I sometimes do plant the white bark birches, but I always plan on them only being alive for maybe five to seven years around here. They just, they just don't last very long. They're, they're so unhappy with our humidity. But this makes a great one. And there are other really nice forms of river birch. There's a great weeping form called Summer Cascade. There are some Duraheat and Heritage that have great bark. But if you don't have a lot of room, this little king is great. It's just when you first grow it, it'll be more like a shrub than a tree. But if you allow it to grow, it, it'll really start showing off that bark at a surprisingly young age. And that's another one that you could plant in kind of a damp spot in the garden as well, although it's just fine in drier areas. Speaking of that peeling bark, one of the, the most widely known plants in trees for that really gorgeous peeling bark are the paper bark maples, Acer grissium. And if you go to old collections and you see big old Acer grissium, they'll just blow you away. They have this real beautiful cinnamon colored bark. It can be, this isn't super glossy yet. As it gets older, this will get glossier and glossier. I mean, it can look really almost metallic as it peels off in little sheets. There's people that had, had kind of stopped growing a lot of paper bark maples because everything that was being grown was, didn't grow very well. They didn't perform. And what some researchers at a couple of botanic gardens hypothesized and, and did the, the researchers research on and really tested this was they were saying that they went back and figured out where all these paper bark maples had come from. And they had come from just a very few collections into Europe and the U.S. And they were, everything that was being grown commercially was, they were from these original collections, but they were just seed that they kept collecting from the, you know, they collected seed and grew them out and, you know, maybe planted one or two trees to collect the seed to grow out for more plants. And they kept doing that. And there was a real genetic bottleneck and it had gotten to the point where the plants didn't have much vigor anymore. And they went around, these researchers went around and tested all the paper bark maples that they could, they could find in the U S and the UK. I don't know if they did Europe as well and really figured out, you know, how few there were. And so then they went and collected seed from paper bark maples, um, as many locations as they could in China where it's native. And by doing that and bringing in more genetics, they have increased the vigor of the new plants. So for a long time, I just stopped even trying to grow paper bark maples. And I thought it was because they wouldn't grow in the South because all the old collections are up like at the New York Botanic Garden, Missouri Botanic Garden, uh, in the Philadelphia area, the Arnold Arboretum and all these places that have been collecting and were collecting in the wild for a long time. And the commercial material that was down South didn't work. So using the new genetics, one of the tree growers in in the West Coast, J. Frank Schmidt, they've uh, put out this new one, which is called Fireburst, which really seems to have great vigor, is growing fantastic in our garden. It's still fairly young, but you can see it put on a lot of growth this year. We're going to have to do some, some pruning and cleaning up and getting a better form on it because it was so vigorous. So I'm really excited by these new selections of paper bark maple. So, so this is going to go back on my list of recommended plants for people because I don't think it was the heat. I think it was just that lack of vigor. Of course, a favorite of ours, this is an introduction from the Arboretum and I've, one I, that I'm just thrilled to death is finally getting into, into the trade. Cornus wilsoniana white jade. Cornus wilsoniana is a, a gorgeous tree with the, gorgeous dogwood with white to greenish cinnamon bark and 
the one that we've been growing at the Arboretum for a long time, we finally, after collecting some seed from other sources and growing them out, we finally put a name on it, White Jade, because we've realized ours is simply the, the best form that's out there. It really is superior to everything else that we've seen in terms of how white the bark is. Great is a multi-stem tree like ours. You can also grow it as a single trunked specimen where it's, it's beautiful as well. And flower, it's nice. It's covered in these flat panicles of white flowers. I think that's incredibly showy. When you tell people it's a dogwood, they, you know, they are expecting, you know, the large bracted dogwoods because, you know, the large black bracted flowers, because that's what we typically see on trees. But this is, this has got these small flowers. We were trying to figure out what would be the best thing for to graft this on. I asked our resident NC State dogwood expert, Jenny Jang, about it. And she gave me the names of two Chinese dogwoods that I have never heard of. So we're still, we're not sure what's going to be the best thing to graft this on. But we do have some wholesale nurseries that are very, very interested in bringing white jade into production. So I think in just a few years, we should see this come, start to come out on the market. And couldn't pass up talking about Lagerstremia farii. That's misspelled. There should be an I. It should be F-A-U-R-I-E-I. -E Lagerstremia farii, the Japanese crepe myrtle, has this wonderful peeling bark. If you think of crepe myrtles with beautiful bark, they get that beautiful bark mainly from this Japanese species. So as I always tell people, any of the crepe myrtles with Native American names like Tuscarora, Miami, Natchez, any of those all were bred with this showy or flowering crepe myrtle. It's very disease prone, powdery mildew prone, especially. Lagostremia farii is, is very mildew resistant. So it, it brought mildew resistance and beautiful bark into the Lagostremia indica. And then what Lagostremia indica brought is all kinds of different flower colors because the Japanese crepe myrtle only has white flowers and they, they don't last for nearly as long as the others. We have some of the original U.S. introductions of these plants from 1956 and they, they are gorgeous. And all of them have just stunning bark. But a seedling from one of our plants gave rise to a selection that is called townhouse because it was growing in what was called our townhouse garden, kind of a model garden. This is three pictures of the very same plant taken at different times of the year. The bark on it is like a living thing. It is different sometimes. It's depending on the time of year and how it's peeling. It's very, very kind of soft cinnamon color and, and smooth at other times as it's really just flaking off. And you can see these big pieces coming off. It's got this much brighter orange and greens and purples in there and almost blues, really just a rainbow. And then other times it's, it's more of a cocoa copper color to it. So it changes all the time. It is, in my mind, just absolutely simply the very best crepe myrtle for spectacular bark color. Lagostremia farii townhouse. And it has the white flowers. They last for, oh, two to three weeks in the summer and are beautiful. But I grow this one for the bark. And you can sometimes buy it as a single trunk, sometimes as a multi-trunk uh, plant. Either way, it's, it's gorgeous. Another plant that is hard to beat for bark, a whole group, the Stewardias, most of the Stewardias, Stewardia pseudocamellia. So these are camellia re relatives. And this is maybe the best one I've ever seen. This is at the uh, Nikko Botanic Garden in Japan. It's a really old Stewardia pseudocamellia. It's just beautiful. And all of these plants with bark that peels off like this, they look different throughout the year. It depends on when you take that picture because they will actively peel at certain times. And so you get different colors and you can kind of see just next to each other because of the exposure of each 
This one has mostly peeled off uh, and this one is just really getting started to up here. So it still has some of the greens and other colors. This is a younger stem, a different plant from that, but over time it will get, you know, more like, like this plant here. Storia pseudocamellia, you can see with the flower white, you know, you can see that relationship with the camellia. You can think of these as deciduous camellias with great color, a little more tree-like than camellias, but this is an especially nice kind of upright one, but you can see all those flowers. And most of the Asian stortias flower around June for us here in North Carolina. They may be a little bit later if you're in a, a colder climate, but but not too much earlier typically than that. Stewardia monodelpha, another gorgeous plant with kind of more cinnamony bark, but it tends to peel off in very small little pieces and I think is gorgeous, especially when backed with evergreens like this. This is it, another plant at, an, at another time of year, but still that gorgeous bark. And, and again, it makes a really lovely tree with these lovely flowers. Monodelpha is a fairly small flowering one compared to Pseudocamellia. And then Stewardia sinensis, variety sinensis. We have a, a single trunked one and you can see how the bark peels off on it a little bit more like the paper bark maple perhaps in larger pieces. But the older bark always turns more cinnamony than the younger bark before of a, a duller brown and then it'll peel off and where it peels off, it'll be very white. And what was white this year will turn to that cinnamon color. So it's it really a, an evolution of color. And again, these beautiful little flowers. Now, unfortunately, our own, one of our natives, Stordia malacodendron, that's native here to central North Carolina, which has drop dead beautiful flowers and white flowers like this and these stamens, but each of the tips of all these stamens are little purple anthers, which are gorgeous. But it can have nice bark, but not as good as these Asian ones. You have to get a really old story of malacodendron to, to get that, to get anything. But it is, it is worth growing just as a plant because it's beautiful. Now, one, we don't grow as much as I think we should. And part of the reason for that is because of some diseases. This is Pseudocydonia sinensis, the, the quince. Not to be confused with flowering quince, Shinomalies. This is the fruiting quince. Grows often multi-stemmed, can be kept a single stem, but it'll try to sucker. And, you know, kind of this, the pretty typical. But the bark, um, again, is gorgeous in these flaky patterns. As it gets older, it's often fluted like this. Yeah, really, really beautiful. And the bark, is, I mean, it just, each plant seems to be different. This is an especially nice one that I always see in Japan, right outside of, at a nursery that has, that sells Japanese maples, Kobayashi momiji N, but they have this Pseudocydonia that's, that's beautiful. You know, more dark with light under it. Another another kind of dark color one. Very, very hardy. I don't have a good picture of the flower. I'm not sure why I've never taken a picture of the flower, but they have little pink flowers, which are showy, which give rise to fruits. And these are big. This is, that fruit is going to fill your hand and more. And they're heavy and they're hard. And I guess people make quince jelly out of them and perhaps eat quinces other ways. I've taken a bite out of one, kind of. They're hard as can be. And even when ripe, my experience, everything I've tasted has been hard, but it tastes good. So I think you have to do some prep on that. When, when we get to the end and we're doing questions, somebody who knows more about the quince fruits can tell me because I just, I don't know other than quince jelly and Quince wine, which I've had in China, I don't know a whole lot about the eating of them. The plants can get fire blight, and so a lot of times we don't grow them in the southeast. I think what we should do is get as much germplasm as we can, plant it out, and really test for fire blight resistance and see which ones are the best because they're beautiful, beautiful bark. Don't want to stand under one that's filled, loaded with fruit in a windstorm though, because that sucker will knock you out. 
lace bark pines, which I finally a few years ago was able to see in the wild. That was a real bucket list item for me. Pinus bungiana have beautiful, beautiful bark. And you can see it starts from a pretty young age. This is, you know, maybe a two inch caliper plant and it's already starting to show that lace bark. It seems like every time I see them, they're either scraggly like this or else they are very, very uniform. And it's, uh, I think they start off pretty uniform and then they open up with time. Now in like Japanese gardens and things like that in, Asia, in Chinese gardens, this is humble administrator's garden in Shuzhou, uh, China. They often want more of an open picturesque windswept look. They don't want it a real dense tight one. And this is another one that same plant, this is a gorgeous plant at the National Arboretum. And you can see, depending on the time of year, depending on the time of day, depending on the light, you know, it can look very different, which I just love more so than most other plants. There are a few plants with flowers that depending on the time of day and the light that hit, that's hitting them look very, very different none so much as the bark does on a lot of these trees. And I think that's, for me, helps me kind of watch the plant progress through the seasons as that bark changes. There's a gorgeous, gorgeous one in Seoul, South Korea, that I just had time to swing by in the dusk when I was in Korea, that's supposed to be 600 years old, which was amazing. And it was just almost solid. It was, like almost solid white, like you see down here, but on a big, huge trunk. Uh, uh. So I saw this plant for the first time in 2008 in China. Litsia auriculata is in Eastern China, growing on Tianmushan. And there were trees that were probably 40, 50, 60 feet tall with huge trunks. But they all had this amazing bark and then these huge leaves. I finally figured out it was Litsia auriculata. I visited it the first time in the spring and it was just, it was just leafing out. Almost a decade later, eight years later, I finally got back to that area somewhere near Tianmushan in the fall and was able to collect some seed and now, as far as I know, there are two plants of this growing in the U.S. I don't think there are more. Perhaps there are, but we have one in our nursery here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, and there's one at the Atlanta Botanic Garden that I believe was planted outside this past fall, both the same age. So I am really excited about the prospects of getting this out and available. The person I had talked to about it, how amazing this plant was, when he saw it, Scott McMahon, when he saw it in the bark, he flipped out as well. And it, it didn't have leaves on it when he saw it. So he didn't see these leaves that were 18 inches long and 12 or 14 inches wide. So when it leafed out, he was pretty excited about that as well. So not available now, but we're going to do everything we can to develop more plants, try and root it, try and propagate it, get it grafted if we have to, but we're, we're definitely going to make more of these because it's got a very restricted range in China. Another Litsia is Litsia coriana. Now, I had grown this kind of as a shrubby plant, but in the Kwishikawa Botanic Garden, which is the kind of the University of Tokyo's Botanic Garden, they had this amazing old specimen. Actually had a whole row of them with beautiful peeling bark. Litsia coriana has evergreen to semi-evergreen, kind of narrow, somewhat lanceolate leaves. And like I said, I'd grown it mostly as a shrub, but after seeing this, I went back to a plant that I knew at a different garden and kind of looked under there. And sure enough, as a younger plant, it was already showing some great bark. And often with these evergreen things, you know, this is a tree, but it's going to grow like a shrub for a lot longer than it before it's going to be a tree. But we keep them full down to the ground because we're shrubs. So I pointed out to the new horticulturist at the garden, that if he limbed it up, you'd start to see this great bark and you could start developing it into a tree. And it was, uh, it was kind of neat to see it go from, from being an ever, a nice evergreen shrub to a really standout, spectacular barked plant. This is a plant you can get in the U.S. from 
specialty places now and then, but it's not still not widely available. And you know, speaking of what I was just talking about, I was out in the garden this morning. I was actually admiring the bark on this and saying, well, should I put it in here? Because I love that smooth bark on plants. And I decided I would, but I'd give the full context. This is Ilex cornuta. This is the Chinese holly. If you've grown Burford holly, that is Ilex cornuta. That's a dwarf Ilex cornuta. Ilex cornuta is the species is rarely grown, but cultivars, selections of the species are very widely grown. And this was just a big plant. And years ago here, we were going to take it out. And we decided rather than take it out, we would limb it up just because we wanted some space under it. And, you know, we limbed it up. Yeah, you know, it was grown as a shrub, so we weren't paying attention to the trunk. So it's kind of got a funky trunk there. But, you know, now it's this beautiful, beautiful tree. And... I've been at people's homes, gosh, more times than I can count, where they're like, we got to do something with this, with this hedge or this plant that's just getting too big. It's it's crowding everything out. We want a garden in here. And you know, their their only thought is we've got to rip this plant out because, you know, imagine if this was going all the way down to the crown. You know, this is taking up a tremendous amount of space that you could plant under or or whatever, or just block your view of the house or whatever, but it would just be a lot. But often, instead of getting a tree company to come in and remove the whole tree, you can go in with a pruning saw and limb it up, just take off the lowest branches, you know, up as high as you want, four feet, five feet, six feet, 10 feet, and take this big shrub and turn it into, you know, a beautiful tree that's already well established. So you can get in there and dig around it and you're not going to hurt this plant by digging in where its roots are some or bringing in some, some more compost and putting it over that and, and mixing it in a little bit and improving the soil to plant in. You're not going to hurt this tree at all. You see it done in other places. These are two yews that were, you know, obviously planted to be like foundation plantings here, but yews have gorgeous bark, gorgeous bark. So probably at some point they were just about block. It was probably like a tunnel getting to this door from out here. And so the landscapes company started or landscapers, grounds crew, whoever started limbing these up. And then all of a sudden they became these two trees. Now I would say they need to limb them up above the door and the windows a little bit higher, but rather than removing these and putting in a couple little dinky plants again, they've got great big plants here that can kind of anchor this building. Now the people in second story may not appreciate that, so you may need to come in and trim some of the top, but it is a way to deal with plants. And, you know, I, you see people with, you know, old junipers that are getting big, you know, or something planted at the end of the driveway and they can no longer see around it. They've gotten so huge, they're becoming a nuisance. You know, sometimes you can limb those plants up. Now, sometimes you can't. Sometimes people limb those plants up and they look terrible. So you have to kind of look at what the trunk is going to look like, what the bark is, how it's going to form. But you can limb those, those plants up, you know, during the winter like now and create a whole different look for the plant. And if you don't like it, you can still get a company to come in or you can still rip the plants out, but you know, it, it may save you some time doing a little bit of that. So I know I had said this was gonna be winter bark and form in the garden, but I got so excited about the bark that I didn't have time to do form. So I will point out that on our YouTube site, which hopefully you will like and subscribe to in April of last year, early on when we first started doing these, there is a, a whole talk on planting for architectural interest that talks about weeping plants, talks about upright plants and other natural forms. It also talks about manipulating the form of your plants to create living art. So rather than me hit on just a couple of plants and not really do it justice, I think it'd be better for people to go and visit our other YouTube video. So we'll end with this, just a couple of things that are coming up. You can get more details at our website, jcra.ncsu.edu. Saturday, January 23rd, we've got a great program with a phenomenal climatologist 
who's going to talk about understanding climate patterns and what they mean for weather. So you can kind of get a sense of, we won't be reliant so much on, you know, what is the local news say is going to be coming, but you can kind of see the trends as they're happening and, you know, get, get, a, have a larger sense. Got a great, on Friday, the Friday before that, we've got a great family garden spot. So join at 1030 AM. Again, details, jcra.ncsu.edu. We're going to be talking about bulbs for that program. And uh, got a lot of bulbs popping up in the garden now. Um, so there'll be a lot to share. And two big ones, February 6th, nine o'clock AM Eastern time. We're going to have our free gardening in the South program. This is going to focus on how to make your trees happy. So four ways to make your trees happy and two errors to avoid. I like that. Tell me what to do and tell me what not to do. And I'm pretty good about it, especially if you keep it to six things I have to remember. That's from Basil Camus from Leaf and Limb. We will also have Bill Fontenot, NC State professor, retiring NC State professor to talk about building garden soils at home. Great talk. He gives a fantastically, fantastic talk on that. And Dr. Denisha Seth Carley, another researcher here at NC State University to talk about pollinators and how you can encourage them and garden with them. And again, she is She's fantastic. Like you'll love her. You do need to register, but that is a free program. And then winter symposium, our winter symposium is the third Saturday in February. Eat, drink, and be merry. Chocolate tequila and the intersection of plants and people. This is going to be a talk about ethnobotany. We have somebody who's going to be talking about chocolate and cacao and how it affects communities growing it processing it, how it's kind of has been used by people and historically and into today. Same thing with tequila. We've got somebody who's going to talk about tequila and really how tequila industry, you know, how the, the local people who are growing it and harvesting it, uh, you know, how that all affects things. I, you know, I wish we could do this live uh, in person because I could, I could do some dark chocolate and mezcal combinations, maybe not at 9 a.m., but maybe. And then the last person is Brad Bennett. He's an ethnobotanist at Florida International University. I've traveled with him into the interior of Ecuador before, and he's traveled all through South America, meeting with indigenous peoples and documenting the plants that they use and how they use him. He is fascinating fascinating, fascinating person. So again, all the details are at jcra.ncsu.edu. This is by no means an exhaustive list. We've got plant tours that'll be online. We're co-hosting a Magnolia Society International on the Saturday in between these two, the 13th. Just a, a ton of stuff happening. So check our website and see everything that's going on. And with that, I will be happy to answer questions if there are any or, or learn about quinces and what I should be doing with them. I believe I answered all the questions in the chat. So let's see if anyone has any new questions. Sources for some of these things? Sources for some of these things. Good question. I'm trying to think of some good mail order sources for plants are Forest Farm in Oregon, Woodlanders in South Carolina, Cistus Design Nursery in Oregon, some of the, uh, the MrMaple.com, they're doing a lot more than maples, ginkgos, stewardias, a lot of things that need grafting, so they're a good source. We've got some great nurseries in the area that, that you could check out, Garden Treasures, they're doing a lot of interesting things. You know, and wherever you are, if you go in and talk to your, you know, your local garden centers and ask them to, to look for things, they will try and track them, them down. Where are some other good, well, well, here I'll, I will send you back to another previous talk that you can find on YouTube. We did a, did a whole talk on, on mail order resources. 
So there's there's a great that's a great resource to just go and and watch watch that and and you know if you don't have a lot of time or don't like listening to me, you can you can do watch videos on 1.5 or double speed and then you can zip right through them and just pause it where you where it's hit something interesting. Your comment about asking your local nursery for the plant because they do have access to far more plants than they have at the nursery. Mm -hmm. So it, just just go ahead and ask them. A lot of them do special orders. Mark, in the chat, there was a question or a comment. I believe you went back all the way to the Abihu that you're going to comment about cutting it back at a later time. I oh, think you no, said. I, I, what I was, what I meant was, I was going to talk about cutting back colorful okay. limb things. So I, I was, I was referring more to the what I was going to talk about the winter lightning. I didn't have, I don't have photos of the Abihu cut back, but I'll, that, I'll have to take some next time. That did Mark? inspire some comments in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Mark. Yes, Question Sarah. about that particular plant: Are how how lacy are the leaves? They're full leaves. They're it's it's. Oh, good. They're um, not a lace leaf. They're not a lace leaf. No, okay. no. Can't and they're, do and lace they're green. Leaf here. Too much salt wind. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Arlene Calhoun put our winter a link to our winter symposium in the chat, so you can you can click right on that. Question about the gardening garden open. Oh, we're hoping, but we don't have a firm date. We are we are watching the numbers. We're talking with the university. Students just started back this week on campus, and we know what happened last this past fall when they came back to campus. So we want to make sure everybody's safe. And yeah, we we definitely want our volunteers here. And there, you know, many of our volunteers are in kind of a riskier category, but they they have been you know, we've been getting them back and getting things going. And a hmm. uh, question about any, any tips on where to place shrubs or trees with interesting bark to best display them. You know, if, if they're on their own out, in, you know, like if it's a specimen plant without a lot of things around it, the bark will, will show off. If, if it's not, if you've got a lot of things planted, you really need something contrasting behind it. That may be the wall of a house or a fence or an evergreen plant. I know I've got a friend who has uh, this kind of, I don't know if it's three or four part folding panel outside. I think they made it out of shutters mm. and it's painted kind of a, I don't know, aubergine, I guess, kind of a dark, you know, a purple color. And they kind of move it around their garden. It doesn't sit in one place. So I've seen it behind some birches during the winter, but then I've also seen it kind of behind some flowering shrubs that they didn't feel like were showing up well enough in the garden. And so it's, it's about four or five feet tall and they, they kind of just move it and it, it forces you to pay attention to the, the things that they want you to pay attention to, which I think is a great idea. I would put it out and never move it. So I'm not going to do that. But for, for other people, I think it's a fantastic idea. An additional comment on that. Aren't these plants often more colorful on their southern side where they're exposed to more sun? Yes. Yes. That is, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If you if you can cite them so that they can get that color. Some of the, like the colorful twigged plants, like, like the, Bihu maple and the winter lightning. The, the younger stems tend to be, it tends to be a pretty thin bark. So you want to watch out if you're in an area where plants are really subject to some southwest sun scald inner damage where it's, they're very cold and, and maybe frozen and the sun comes up and, and warms them. If you're in an area where that is a problem with trees, the thinner barked things, you may want to, you may not want to really get them in, in beating south southern sun but otherwise yeah that's a great idea it's also you know it's you know like i said with a lot of these it changes based on on time of day and on season there are some things that i probably walk by just hundreds of times and don't think about and then i'll walk out on like a fall day when the sun is late in the day when the sun is low and the sunlight is much more orange yellow than than bright glaring and all of a sudden a plant will just light up that doesn't at other times of the day. If I were a great garden designer, I could use that to do something with it. I live for happy accidents myself and I will move people around until I accidentally get them in the right spot. 
Marilyn had a comment and then a little follow-up question about some of the plants being grafted yeah. that are the color bar colorful bark and does that impact the cutting back of the plant? Yes, that's a great point. So if, if your plant is grafted, you, you have to pay attention to that and you want to cut well above the graft. So the the willow I was talking about was not grafted, but when we coppice it, we cut it. It's what, two feet tall? Yeah. So we've got a trunk that's, I can't get it in my camera, uh, uh, that's it's pretty big. big around. And then it's just a just a bunch of, of thinner branches coming off of that. And if you do that with something like a, that really puts out on that long growth, like a willow, you know, if you hear, you know, people talk about osier, those are, that's what osiers is, are those thin whippy branches that you can weave into osier fences and things like that. So not only do you get the great color, but when you do, when you do coppice it again, after you've done it once or twice and you're getting that really great growth, you can use those and weave those into all kinds of things in the garden. The winter lightning fox elder, when we coppiced it the first time, it was a, all right, we got to get rid of this thing. It's just not, it's not doing much for us anymore. So we, we chainsawed it down to the ground, but then left the stump with the idea that it might re-sprout, but if it doesn't, then oh well, don't worry about it. Yeah, the, the winter sun, late afternoon sun, shining through the cinnamon bark on a Acer Grism is gorgeous. I'm um, not wondering if you have any comments about Chinese lace bark yeah, elms. Yeah. Lace bark elms are beautiful. I love them. There is some, there's quite a bit of variation in how much mm -hmm. lace sparkiness they are. And the best ones I've seen are usually seedling grown ones, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Probably best. They can, they're a nuisance in some areas. So if you're growing lace bark elms, you may want to look, there's some, some newer, more, I don't, I don't know if they're sterile, but some forms with, with less fertility, we'll say. I don't remember names of any of those right off the top of my head. I know. Linda just asked if you know of any Melaleuca that might be hardy zone seven and available here. And available here. Um, <laughs> There's a wrinkle. Uh, yeah. Let me think. So I'm trying to think of, I know we've grown some, I, the place, I, there are a couple places and I can't remember the names of them that specialize in Australian plants. I'm not sure the names, but I, I've ordered from them in the past. And then the other place that I would try is Cystus Design Nursery. I mentioned them before, but I don't know. I, I don't know of any melon lucas that would be hardy in zone seven. Let me, let me start there. It is a, I love them and I would love to, to get a whole collection of them and plant them out and see what they do. And I it may do that at, at some point. We've done that with kibis and we've done that with grevilleas. There are not many of those, either of those that will work for us. You know, we've done some leptospermums and things, but yeah. So, okay. Marilyn, Paul is wondering. Paul's okay. wondering if you have a Stewardia that you can recommend for the Wilmington area. Any of them? Stewardia sinensis, Stewardia ovata, Stewardia pseudocamellia, Stewardia rostrata, Malacodendron. If you can get it, you know I've I've grown those all in coastal Virginia. I've done them in Atlanta. Done them done them here in Raleigh, and they all do well. They don't want salt spray on them. So if you're real close to the coast in Wilmington, perhaps not, but otherwise, uh, yeah, it should be able to do them just about anywhere. And Anne's wondering how red osier dogwood grows in this area. So red osier is there, that's kind of a catch-all term. So Cornus alba and Cornus sericea are the two main red stem, red osier dogwoods. And their Cornus sericea is, gosh, I never can remember. Are they native to Europe or? or I'll look that one up. You look that up because I never can remember. That has been a, that has been an issue with me since my plant ID class. There is, there is some, some block on the stem dogwoods. There are 
there are Cornus amomum is one of our the East Coast native dogwoods that's you know shrubby dogwood like that and it ha can have red bark and there are some selections being made that have red bark. In fact, I almost showed one. There's one we have, we're growing called paprika. That's very good. I am finding that some of the newer selections of red stem dogwoods, red osier dogwoods, are much more canker resistance than the old ones. Like the old Bailey eye was terrible with canker. But we are growing one that's called Baton Rouge. That's been fantastic. No canker, no, no issues at all. A couple of gold stem, gold leafed ones. Avalon Gold has the red stems, gold leaves, white flowers. Hedgerows Gold I've found to be pretty good. That's a variegated one. But a lot of the, a lot of the older ones are a real issue with, with canker and, and powdery mildew. So Saracia is the, one of the native ones. Saracia is native. Okay. So yes. Uh, yeah. If you look for Cornus Saracia. <laughs> but I'm not the only one that kind of gets uh, <laughs> a little confused with them all. Yeah. They're confused in the, in the trade too. And also yeah. Cornus, you can see Cornus stolonifera as well, but that's, that's really Cornus Saracia. That's, that's, I don't think that's a valid name anymore. Great. And Marilyn just asked, "Is does Stewardia rostrata have good bark?" Stewardia rostrata, yes, it has good bark. Not as not as nice as some of the other ones, but it's a good performer. It's it's kind of more of a smooth, muscly bark. But yeah, it's it's very it's very attractive. Well, I believe that takes care of all the questions in the chat, Mark. I don't see anything new coming up. All right, I believe I got ones earlier. Well, I'm going to talk about some winter foliage next week. I have a lot to choose from. That <clears> should be, that should be fun. And is that the last in? That's the last one of the month. It's the last one in the month. Okay. So next, next week, if you join me, I'll have a little more information about what January will look like January. at this same bat place, same bat time. Mm -hmm. hey, you're not going to stop, stop doing these all together, are you? Oh no, I'll still do one of these once a month and I'll also okay. be a part of the other ones as too. But but let me tell you, I'm the most boring person that we have working here. We got some great people here and they've got so much, so much knowledge. So we're gonna spread it around so that you'll get to meet some of the other staff and get to get to be out in the garden more. And but no, I'm I'm definitely gonna be a part of this. I, I love this. I, I wouldn't give it up. It's been fun and and when we get back into whatever normal is again. We want to we want to make this sustainable so we can keep doing it. Feel like it's been so well received. We don't want to just stop mm -hmm. it. So we're transforming it into a sustainable way to go. Yeah, because I think I would go into withdrawal. Oh, we wouldn't want that. And we don't think anyone's <laughs> going to be disappointed with what we have coming up either. No, There's so many things we planned. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for another wonderful bit Thanks of information. Yeah. You're welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, everyone. What was that, Carolyn? It was a fabulous series. Well, thank I, you. I, I appreciate knowing about the, the barks and all that. And I was just, I, I'm looking at this winter, oh, it's, it's the red, red berries on this plant. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much to cut it back. It's... I wish I could think of the name winterberry, I think, or something like that. Is that so winterberry holly deciduous? Yeah, no, it's not a holly. It is deciduous though, but it has berries that are about a third of an inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. Birds like it. If it's if it's a winterberry, that is actually a holly. It doesn't look like a holly, but it it is oh. actually a holly. It depends on how much you want to cut it back. There are there are a few on NC State campus that have grown up into trees that are, that are really beautiful. They kept pruning them to a, a few stems and let them grow up. But otherwise, you'd want to prune them fairly soon, hopefully after the birds get, get to the berries. Here, I'll show you what it looks like now. Do you see it there um, by the wall? I, I see it by the wall, but let me, hold on, let me get it's you. About, it's about three and a half feet tall, maybe? Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out how much to cut it back or if I would be getting fewer berries if I did that. Well, as long as you, you cut it back, if you cut it back soon and not too hard, you would still get berries. 
but it doesn't need to be cut back, I guess, is, is the thing. You can cut it back if you want to contain it for size. And there I just, yeah. you know, carefully cut here and there to keep it uh, the size the size that you like. Yeah. You know, one thing that baffles me is how much to, if you want to keep, keep a uh, conifer in, in check, how much and how to go about pruning that back. You know, if you ever did a program on that, I'd love to <laughs> Well, that's, that is a great idea for a program pruning conifers because there, there is, is a lot of difference between different types of conifers. And Mm -hmm. if you prune the wrong conifer the wrong way, that's it. That's toast. Never recovering. (laughs) Um, Whereas others will. Timing is very important. The pruning conifers that Chris, that one needs to go on the spreadsheet and something like that will be perfect. Perfect. That is what we're looking at as we move forward with these mm-hmm. programs. So that, yeah. that topic will be, will be great. Um, Excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <clears throat> All righty. Yeah. We, fantastic. Yep. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ed Bilderbeck gave a great pruning demonstration some years back at the uh, Green and Growing Trade Show. Mm -hmm. And I learned most of everything I know about pruning from that one demonstration. To get him back, he's good. Yeah, he's hard to get back. He's he's retired. He doesn't he doesn't want to come back. We got him chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) We did get him to do a, a great program on on pruning for us once for one of these gardening in the south series i don't know if that's online or not but yeah he is uh, you know he spent a career really teaching people to do that and he's he was a phenomenal teacher so um you're you're right on the ball with that for sure and if anyone wants to count next week's midweek with mark will be the 39th oh my 39th 39th Nice. And then, of I, course, we I, midweek without Mark, and we had the midweek with Bryce, so we're over 40 total. That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. excellent. Yeah. Didn't repeat myself too many times, I hope. But, uh, I do that in a normal conversation sometimes, so uh, within 15 minutes, so probably did. Wait till you get my age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hoping. I'm hoping I do. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, everybody. I will see you next week. Looking right. forward to it. Take care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Have Thank a great you week, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.